You're listening to a proud member of the Fight Fans Radio Network. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the Untethered MMA Podcast. I am your host, Mike Fagan. With me, as always, Mr. Derek Subotsicki. Just going to let that intro music play a little longer. Somebody? Anybody? Oh boy, I had my mic on mute. Wow, yeah, if you guys can hear me, at least, tweet, at least tweet me and make fun of me so I'm not fucking, you know, just talking into a dead line here. Uh, that's my bad. That's my bad. All right. I am Mike Fagan. I am with Derek Subutiki, Matt Roth in Las Vegas covering uh, UFC 148 for the, uh, the bastion of journalism, BleacherReport.com. If you want to call into the show, you can call in at 410-988-6525. And the the more modern way of communicating with us on Twitter, uh, you can reach me at It's Mike Fagan. You can reach Derek at Fightlinker Subbo. And if you want to bother Matt Roth and try to get him to call into the show, you can get him at Matt Roth 512. And Derek, before we get into your big news uh, from this week, I just want to tell you that I am sweating balls here. It's, uh, It's been... It's been hitting triple digits here in Chicago the last couple of days, uh, and we've also got the humidity. We, we had a nice little break for about five minutes. We had a nice little uh, rainstorm, but it stopped, and now it's just going to get more and more humid. Well, that sucks shit to hear. We were setting record temperatures um, last week You know when my town started burning down. We hit 101, which was our all-time record for the springs any day of the year. And about 20 other state records were uh, broken on that day. So we don't have the humidity. It's dry. But, God, we wish we did because you don't have to worry. You probably had fireworks in your city last night despite the high temperatures in our city. Having fireworks on you right now gets you a summons, <laughs> a 90-day sentence, and a $500 fine. Uh, you did get a good fireworks show last week, though. Too soon? Sure. Too soon? Uh, I, I mean, yeah, my dad's house just got um, unevacuated last night, so he gets to go home. But, uh they have a staging area at a call center right down the uh, from the neighborhoods that have been burned so that you and your insurance rep can get permission to go up there. So still a little sensitive, Mike. <laughs> um, yeah, we, we're also setting record temperatures. I know today and tomorrow, uh, we're so, uh, today for sure, tomorrow we're supposed to hit uh, record temperatures for, for the day. And we might have hit that yesterday as well. Uh, and also, uh, I was also before the show, I was watching the White Sox sweep the Texas Rangers, and now I'm, uh, I'm officially buying into this, this White Sox team. I, w- I was on the fence. I thought they just had like a good first half, but uh, with the plus 60 run differential and, and sweeping the uh, probably the best team in the major leagues, it's, uh, it's about time that I just sort of throw in my hat and just, just uh, take this one all the way. Well, that's, that's great you're taking. I'm going to go with the best team in the major leagues, which is the Rangers. But Yeah, but you're a Rockies fan. I know, but we're probably the we're one of the worst teams in the league. We're if it wasn't for Cargo and Tulo, then we would be the worst team in the league. Well, it's it's going to be tough to beat out the Chicago Cubs this year. I'm just gonna. I'm well, just gonna I got, they don't they don't have Cargo or Tulo. If you take away those two guys, we're the Chicago Cubs. 
I don't know. The, the Cubs have some quality players, but uh, well, that, well, they yeah. have like a Kadir. We have a Kadir at second base who's decent. Helton's been putting up decent numbers. He's in the Hall of Fame for sure. But uh, we have two superstars, and that's the only thing that you know. If without them, I don't know how we have twenty wins at this point. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, we're sorry, that you shit, to- dude. Jamie Moyer was our most depending, dependable starting pitcher this year. All right, we're going back. We're doing a Jeff Francis redux. That's how bad our starting pitching is right now. Yeah, I haven't had to. I mean, the, I haven't had to root for for that bad of a team uh, in a long time. So I, I, it just takes us back. We we were bad for a long, long time after. I mean, between ninety five and two thousand seven, we didn't make the playoffs. But then for a solid three or four years there, we were really good. We made the World Series. We were competitive. But uh, yeah, it's not. It, it fell apart a little bit. Our we yeah. It's not good. And it's not because we traded Ubaldo him in as you fucking idiots. That wasn't the problem. Yeah. Um, but we do have some good news, Derek. Uh, I don't remember when uh, when this happened, but uh, it was it was big news. Uh, I'll let you break it since uh, it's, it's your personal thing. Yeah, it was Sunday morning. Um, we got let back into our neighborhood on Friday night after the um, fire raced into the neighborhood on Tuesday the 26th. So we were out for three days. I came back uh, Saturday morning, the night of the fire from the um, place we uh, evacuated to. I took the dog. My mom and her boyfriend got a hotel room. But I went down to a friend's house, and my dog slipped out of his harness Houdini style and ran off. So for uh, four days and four nights, you know, driving around that neighborhood, yelling, putting up posters and everything, uh, get home on Saturday and uh, wake up Sunday morning, and uh, he's up up, up this morning because the the uh, pound had called my mom, and she went down and got him. Didn't tell me until I woke up. Yeah, I've I've, uh, I've had a cat that uh, a couple of times he's run off, and um, you know it's a little different. You know, you were in a disaster situation, and, and there's there's a lot of different things that are going on there. But uh, after a while, you know, with him, it became uh, not if he was coming back, but when. Uh, you know, he he was the right. kind of cat that would get out and just kind of roam around for a while, and then you know either get hungry or just be like, eh, I kind of want to go back home. Um, so, but, but it, I mean, those first couple of times, that anxiety you feel of like, well, this was how, how, like, long, how long do you wait before, you, you know, you, you kind of give up and, well, I mean, like I said, it had gotten to four days and we got him the microchip. So the idea was if he lives, if anybody ever finds him, then we'll get him back. That's why we spent the money on it. But the, what he had done is he had run about a mile Northeast away from the fire or from where we were staying, where I evacuated to. And a lady had seen him. Three days before she brought him into the pound, she saw him in her neighborhood but couldn't get him because he was so scared she had to try to lure him with food. And then on the third day, he finally got hungry enough and took some, and she grabbed him. And thank so, God. Have, have you met this lady? Do you know anything about her? Or No, the Humane Society, if you take a dog to the pound and you drop it off, they don't, they're not legally allowed to tell you anything or tell the person whose dog it is anything about who brought him in. So we have no idea. Um, if she's one of the 30 people listening, then thank you very much. But, yeah. um, yeah, no, it was, she didn't see the posters or anything. We, they, the, he had run out of the neighborhood. We put those up in. So she just, uh, picked them up and took them to humane society. And the first thing that they do is, uh, scan the dog for the microchip and they called us. Yeah. And it was really good news too. Like, uh, you know, I, I've, I've garnered a reputation and probably not unfairly of kind of being a cold hearted, uh, joking motherfucker, but uh, I, I was actually really happy to see that you uh, had found your dog, and uh, you know, it, it was it made me, it made pretty me, much like, a stroke of luck. That little yeah. bastard is going to obedience class next week, just so everybody knows. He needs to learn what the fuck Khmer means. <laughs> and by obedience class, you mean beating him and kicking him until he figures we're, out. No, we're lo- we're, now we're looking at options. There's one with a shock collar that I actually put the collar on and tried it. It doesn't, you know, zap your ass or anything. It just kind of bugs you. So. We'll see. I mean, I don't know what we're going to do with him, but he was allowed to live with his personality and just be a free boy for about a year, and that time's over now. Yeah, and if uh, if anyone out there listening, all 35 of you, uh, if anyone's had experience with uh, dog training and uh, what they found to, to work the best, uh, let Derek know. So maybe you won't have to beat his dog into submission. Uh, but let's, uh, this might be the quickest intro we've had uh, getting into the MMA. Uh, we're 10 minutes in. Uh, big fight card this weekend, Derek. No, you're kidding. Who's fight? I don't know. I, I saw a dude on ESPN. He was talking to John Buchagross. I don't know. Some white guy. Some white guy. He's it probably going to get his ass kicked. The white guy in a main event. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, did we talk about our predictions for the fight yet? Have we talked about that at all? Um, no, we really haven't. And it's actually, this is one of those cards that you can't, like, look at a fight and be like, oh, how the fuck is this on the main card of the UFC pay-per-view? Like, they all, I know that Cody McKenzie, Chad Mendez is a little weird, because what the hell is McKenzie doing there? But all Mendez did was lose to Jose Aldo, so he's not spoiled goods by any means. And Mike Easton versus Ivan Menjibar is a very relevant fight at Bantamweight. So this whole main card is pretty badass. We can do predictions for all of them if you want to. Uh, and I don't, because I never want to do... I hate predictions. I know, but th- it's a whole card that's good, and a lot of these fights are toss-ups. I mean, you have Damian Maya's welterweight debut. You have the return of Patrick Cote. Like, I mean, these these are some fun who-you-got fights where you're not going to look like an idiot if you pick wrong because they're close. All right, well, we can do the top four because that's all I give a shit about. Oh, you don't like Ivan Menjivar versus Mike Easton is going to be an I awesome like the, fight, I, and I the like winner the of it's right there. They're in the mix. I like the fight fine. It just, uh, it's just it's the top four that I'm really... Okay, even the well, Kung, even the even the Kung Lee Patrick Cote fight, I I don't like Kung Lee, but there's something about him fighting guys that it, it's always sort of an interesting matchup. Okay, well then why? The, oh yeah, well we wouldn't want to talk about interesting matchups on this show now, would? We? Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, let's but, talk about Maya Kim. Do you, who do you got there? Do you think that Kim is too fucked up from Condit? Do you think he's going to come back okay? I, I actually like Maya. I I've my thing with Maya. I mean, a lot of it's going to depend on how he handles the weight cut. Um, he, he was never a huge 185-er, um, so hopefully he can get down to 170 pretty easy. But I, I just think uh, Kim's a guy that um, – and, and to be fair, Maya's actually kind of like this too. But um, Kim's a guy who, who hasn't really beat any sort of elite competition. Uh, he's got a lot of good you know, quality wins, but nothing great. And when he's fought the great guys, he's you – know, for instance, Condit, uh, he's gotten beat. And even the Parisian fight where it's a no contest um, – you know, regardless of how you scored it, it was a really close fight with yeah, a guy. I had him winning that fight on the scorecards before the whole painkiller thing. I gave him yeah. two rounds. I, I think live I did too. I, I don't know if I've watched it since then, but um, you know, either way, it was a it was a closer fight against a guy who uh, proceeded to really just fall off the rails. Um, so, and I think uh, I think his style is is not great for for a guy like Damian Maya. I think. Um, you know, he's a guy that likes to get on top and work from there, and, and that's not necessarily the best position against a guy like Maya. You know, and you and you say that, but that's what people said going into the Mark Munoz fight, and people were saying it going into the Chris Meidman fight as well. And both of those guys sat on Damian Maya and didn't get subbed. The last time Damian Maya submitted anybody was Chael Sonnen back at UFC 95 in 2009. His last one, two, three, four, five, six, seven fights have all gone to decision, and he's four and three in them. And well, I, 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 and my counter to that, though, is that both Weidman and Munoz are, are really good wrestlers, and they're both, I mean, huge guys at 185. And, uh, you know, Kim's a pretty good size 170, but um, I don't think he's going to be – if he is bigger, he's not going to be any noticeably bigger than Maya on Saturday. I think, I think that he is a solid size at 170. I think his judo is really going to allow him to dictate where the fight takes place. He'll get top position. And I think he has sufficient uh, uh, sub-defense – in that, you know, in that regard that he's going to be able to grind out a decision. I mean, Damian Maya has gone a combined 15, 30, 45, 60, 75, 90, 115 minutes in his last seven fights without submitting anybody. Yeah. Uh, my thing too, though, is, uh, Maya has, um, he has better takedowns than people give him credit for. I mean, they're not traditional wrestling takedowns, but, um, the, the, his problem has been that he's, he hasn't had that, uh, um, that that sort of uh, he hasn't had that that uh, urgency to to take a fight to the ground like, uh, like I he think showed that in his he, first yeah. handful of fights. I don't think he beats Kim by taking him down, and I don't think he beats Kim by. I think the only way he really beats Kim is if he, his hands look good against Munoz, and they didn't look that uh, terrible in the other two fights since then. But I and Kim has shown that you know if you catch him right, then he can fall like Conda did. I mean, he's a beautiful flying knee but he got dropped and didn't really have the presence of mind to even pretend to defend himself after that. So I think that's my only route to victory. I don't think he can win a decision. See, I think he can. I, you know, I, I, looking back at his fights, you know, looking back at his losses, he lost to Mark Hart by KO. And, I mean, that, that's 21 seconds and uh, whatever. And obviously he lost to Anderson Silva, which uh, almost every guy in the UFC has lost to Anderson Silva. Uh, the Munoz fight and the Wyden fight, I, I, I thought both were close. I thought the Munoz fight was closer. Um, and if you, if you believe these sorts of things, uh, Maya was pretty sick heading into the Wyden fight. Um, 
so if you want to sort of uh, shift your analysis or, or, or how you view that fight in retrospect with that information, uh, you know, I don't think he put up a really bad performance, all things considered. Um, well, Weidman's also a baby. I mean, Weidman is a neophyte in the MMA game, and he's probably been doing jujitsu for about the same time that Damian Maya has been like a secondary black belt. So when you look at it that way, at the size difference is the most intriguing thing was because was Damian really just walking around at like a buck 90, just getting grinded on by guys that blew it up to 215 between fights? Because that's yeah. possible, and that's what we're going to see here. But Kim's not a small welterweight, and he's not weak in the areas where Maya is strong. So I'm going to take Kim by decision. All right, I'll take uh, I'll take Maya by uh, submission in round number two. Um, the next fight uh, up on the card: Kung Lee and Patrick Cote. Uh, I I really like Cote in this fight. I've I've said that from the start when this fight was announced. Uh, when Franklin ended up on the 147 card, uh, I've never been a huge Kung Lee guy. I I I, I like watching him fight because, like I said, I think he presents an interesting style and an interesting uh, uh, foil for for his opponent. But I don't think he's very good, and I think he's undersized at at 185. And uh, considering he's got this movie career, this, this budding movie career, uh, he doesn't really have the same sort of motivation as a traditional fighter would. And we know he's fighting on the China card coming up later this year that we'll talk about later. Um, so he doesn't have that, that, that motivation, that, that must-win motivation, because uh, he knows he's got a job intact if he wants it. Uh, assuming, the, you know, assuming he doesn't get just completely uh, embarrassed and the UFC changes their mind. Um, your thoughts, Derek? Kung Lee might die in the cage. <laughs> you, the think same one I made, it, you think it's that big of a mismatch? Well, that's the same prediction I made before the Vandalay Silva Kung Lee fight, and the same one I made for Kung Lee versus Rich Franklin. The hunger argument that you bring up is really the reason that I think this is going to be a bloodbath because you have Kung Lee, who's pretty much sailing off from the sunset. He has a number of different interests, as you said. And then you have Patrick Cote, who battled his way back into the UFC after that horrendous knee injury against Anderson Silva and getting cut again after the loss to Belcher. So he's back. He's still got years ahead of him. He still wants to be a, he still wants to be a UFC fighter for years to come, even if it's just on Canadian shows because he'll make more money doing that than anything else, versus a guy like Kung Lee who's sitting on more money right now than Patrick Cote will ever see. So I think that that hunger argument means that Cote is going to come out there and want to put on a really, really good performance. Yeah, and, and you know, Cote also is a, is a super tough dude. He's got, he's got pretty heavy hands. Um, the only way I see him losing is if it turns out something – first of all, if it turns out that Cote is shot, which I, I don't think is, is a reasonable thing to, to assume. Um, but if somehow he's just flummoxed by, by how Lee fights, because it is a unique and, and, and different style. Um, uh, let me quickly correct myself. He was actually cut after the loss to um, to Tom Lawler. Uh, he came yes. back a year a year and a half after the Anderson Silva fight. Lost to Alan Belcher. No shame there. There's the uh, loss to Lawler. After that, he's won four straight since. If I'm reading his record correctly, he has never been stopped via KO or TKO. Yeah, and I, you know the, that the thing too about the Anderson Silva fight. Um, you know, I think uh, a lot of people. A lot of people, in retrospect, after the Maya fight, uh, looked at this that fight and and thought, you know, Anderson took it easy on him. Anderson was was kind of playing around. Uh, but if you watch that fight again, Anderson lands a, a, a good handful of just super heavy shots, and Cote doesn't really even seem to react. Uh, I know there's he's got one. A chin. He's yeah, got a I know chin. There, there was a flying knee. There was a flying knee. Yep, first, that's the one that I always round. kind of remember. Yep, and, and, and he just, just and he just looked at him. He's just yep. like, all right, well, what's next? Right, exactly. Um, and you know, actually, looking back on on this record, uh, losing to Silva, Belcher, and Lawler, um, kind of weird that he got cut. Lawler's a little weird. Lawler, well, that might have been the one Lawler of those fight was that, weird. Yeah, I agree. Once they give you Tom Lawler and Tom Lawler beat you, it's not like all right. Well, we'll give you somebody shittier, and then maybe you know that's tough. So they let him go down. He beat Caleb Starnes. He beat uh, three other guys that I've never heard of before. Although Todd Brown kind of reach, uh, rings the bell. That was at a catch weight of one ninety. Um, I, I, I have faith in Cote's ability to come back and do some good things. If the knee is healthy, he's still 32 years old. Uh, he's still, you know, uh, training out of sit Dong and TriStar. So those are still good, relevant gyms. Why not? Someone's asking for a link to the show on Twitter, which I already sent out. Uh, no, I didn't Jesus. find it. This is, this is ridiculous. All them out, dude. Don't, none of this some shit. What is their at? What is their slick, avatar say? Slick Rick the Fish. Of course, now well, my timeline's hey, not loading an, up for me. That's an important listener. You better do right by Slick Rick the Fish. 
I gotta, that's, I gotta get. And that's da fish, right? Not the fish. Da, da fish. yeah, da fish, like like da bears or doubles. Da bears, double doubles. Um, let's move on. And uh, I kind of got a couple. Uh, I, got, I got a side topic for this fight. Uh, the the Forrest Griffin Tito Ortiz. The rubber match we've all uh, been waiting match. for. Yes, the cult main event. Before we actually get into the fight itself, I want to ask you, Derek. Um, first for Ortiz, but also for Griffin, because um, the possibility of him retiring is is. It's kind of hanging over this fight. Um, what are their legacies to you after they're done fighting? How one do you view greatest, them? One of the greatest trilogies in mixed martial arts history. I'm working on my voiceover skills so I can start selling this shit a little bit better. <laughs> um, Tito's legacy is still is going to be, what, the second longest reigning light heavyweight champ of all time, next to Chuck? Uh, as far as a consecutive streak? Did Chuck? Did Chuck take his... I believe he did. I believe Chuck set the record for most consecutive days as light heavyweight champ. Oh, I, 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 I prefer to go by title defenses. I don't. I don't think uh, actual length of the reign really means much to me. Well, that's because you're a fucking elitist, Mike. <laughs> Chuck defended the title what, one, two, three, four times, and I'm pretty sure Tito defended more times either way i mean both guys you know defended it five, tito won it and then defended one two three four five times before losing it to uh randy yeah so i mean unless uh unless john jones dies or moves up the heavyweight before I, I think he'll probably surpass them but uh as of as of the today uh, ortiz still has the most well and if you look at it in that way bear with me on this analogy for a little bit and you may laugh at it but tito ortiz could be considered the Matt Hughes of the light heavyweight division in so much as he was the most dominant champion with the most defenses until somebody came and took it from him, but it's still, you know, very respectable mark at the time I, I, was as dominant as anyone that had any, we would ever seen it that way. I think that's a, a pretty apt description. I think well, uh, given, given their style, give, I mean, uh, you know, they kind of have that same sort of uh, ground and pound style, not, not too great on the feet, uh, kind of known for being cardio machines. At least after a certain point, for in, in yeah, Hughes in has a better case. sub game, like absolutely. Yes, yes, Hughes is a better overall grappler, but um, yeah, especially given their 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 time and you know when they were fighting and when they were champions, when they had their their big runs, um, I think that's a pretty apt description yeah. of. And of that, and that was in an era where it was really okay. We have this wrestler turned mixed martial artist, and we're going to put the best of individual disciplines against him, and he ended up beating them all. You know what I mean? Like, Hoist Gracie's better than Jiu-Jitsu at Matt Hughes, but he can't take him out. Carlos Newton better than Jiu-Jitsu at Matt Hughes. Matt Hughes still wins. It's more of a well-rounded fighter that isn't excellent at anything, beating somebody that specializes in one thing. And you saw a lot more of that in the mid-2000s. Yes, and, and Forrest Griffin, I mean, he said at the press conference today that uh, um, he kind of uh, you know uh, reaffirmed his statement if he loses to Tito, he might or, or will retire. Um, he is a minus 300 favorite at the books, um, so it's you know the the odds are against him losing on Saturday. But if he were to lose, or if he were to retire on Saturday night, how do you view Forrest Griffin in you know in the the prism of UFC history? Well, if he loses to Tito Ortiz and retires, and it's a double retirement fight, then that shits on his legacy quite a bit. But I think a lot. I think people look at the clowning at the hands of Anderson Silva and use that as a um, argument against Forrest Griffin's entire career. I think right now he's borderline UFC Hall of Fame, borderline, because he won the Ultimate Fighter. He was the first Ultimate Fighter to win a belt, so he is an actual UFC champion. If you want to use that as a uh, criteria for introduction to the Hall of Fame, he beat Shogun and he beat Rich. And those are two quality wins of guys that might end up in the U- in the UFC Hall of Fame someday. Yeah, I think Forrest is a is a no brainer Hall of Famer. I mean, especially when you when you accept the fact that the UFC Hall of Fame is a uh, you know like we've talked about a promotional Hall of Fame. It's not a traditional independent uh, body. Um, when you when you view it as that sort of you know re- number retirement kind of thing, um, I you know given his place in the history of the UFC and the sport, I, I don't think there's any question that he's going to be in the Hall of Fame. Yeah, uh, and, 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 there, and there is some subjectivity there and probably more in the UFC than in other Hall of Fames. But there is no objective, like, okay, if you get to 3,000 hits and 500 home runs, you're in automatically. We don't care right. about You win 300 games. You know, there is no Hall of Fame that doesn't have guys that should be in there that aren't and guys that aren't in there that should. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, I just think even if you look at his record, um, 
you know, I, I think you're right. I think he would be kind of a borderline decision if if we had like an independent body that wasn't so heavily weighted towards the UFC. But I mean, even the the Shogun Quinton and Ortiz Franklin, and, and assuming he's going to be Tito this weekend, um, you know, right, those I ones forgot are, about Quinton. I forgot that that yeah. I mean, that's who we took about from. That was the guy who'd come in the UFC and just beat the hell out of everybody. You know, beat Chuck <laughs> uh, Marvin Eastman. Yeah, I mean, I think you know, I still think that fight should have been scored a draw. Um, I, you know, it, I don't have a huge issue with Forrest winning it. Um, but you weren't given a ten eight to Forrest in the second. Or no, I guess I, it's a draw for you. It's a draw for me. It's it's I had uh, Quentin round one, three, and four, and then uh, ten eight for Forrest in round two, and he, uh, I had him winning in round five as well. I think I gave the fourth to Forrest if I remember correctly. Yeah, I think that's the that's, big kicks. That's the one round that I, I think uh, most people. Uh, that's kind of what how, you know. What's the crux of their score is? Uh, you know, the, I remember the, I was camping when that happened. That was in 08, and I was way up in the mountains at like twelve thousand feet. Now on my way coming down, I just called a buddy of mine, and he was like, "Yeah, so a uh, forest one." I was like, what "The fuck?" Yeah, I was in a I was in a Vegas off strip casino, um, hanging out with uh, a couple of friends, and then a couple of guys I met from uh, the two plus two gambling forums. And we were all uh, rooting for Rampage while the rest of the bar was rooting for Forrest. So it was, and, and it was, you know, it's one of those fights that everyone kind of got into, uh, even at the bar where you know people were cheering and kind of getting into it and talking, and and uh, it was it was a really fun fun fight to watch. Um, really frustrating for us, uh, obviously, in in the Rampage section. But uh, yeah, I've been trying I, to determine exactly how and where I'm going to be watching these fights uh, this Saturday because if you never go to a bar and if you look down your nose at that for a big fight like this, it can be a pretty good time going to the bar and being the guy there that knows everything about this shit. Yeah, I, I also had a good experience watching uh, Chuck and Rampage 2 at a bar. Uh, it's just, it, it, I think this fight too. So it must so have been a very segregated bar. bar. It must have been a very monochromatic bar that you were. It was a was, it was a a suburban Chicago kind of borderline hick town, so it was yeah, very so cracker ass. Yeah, no, if it was fifty fifty, then I don't know if you would have had as wonderful of a time. Well, I was rooting for Rampage in that fight, so I had a great time watching everyone else uh, <laughs> drown their sorrows in their beer. Yes, and, and that's you know a lot of people disliked Chuck Liddell for his fans at that point. Because he had kind of become like he was like the Stone Cold Steve Austin of the UFC because you know he's the beer swilling, you know, kind of a redneck persona, and the fans really responded to that. So everybody, you know, people root against fighters based on their fans. Fighters can't really help who likes them. So I think that's kind of weird. I, I do want to point out here, uh, John O'Regan or or Regan, uh, I guess he's a web editor for uh, Fighters Only, is mm-hmm. tweeting. I am very reliably informed that both Michael Bisping and Alan Belcher have told Joe Silva they are willing to meet in the octagon as soon as possible. That- Brian Stan was calling out Bisping yesterday, though. That's a bigger fight if they can make it. I, you know what? I actually, I actually think I would like the Bisping Belcher fight more. I think- oh, I'd enjoy it more. You know me and my heart on for Alan Belcher. You know how much I, I love Alan Belcher. I've, I've been getting that hard on too. I've been. Uh, I, well, everybody has it since Belcher, a horror right? fight. But I'm an old school Alan Belcher lover. All right, I loved him before the rest of you bastards. I was the one defending the slam against Cote as a slam as opposed to a spike, which is illegal because it made him land on his face, and you can do that. I love Alan Belcher. I've loved him since UFC Fight Nights. Ever since the Paul Harris fight, everybody's on the bandwagon now. But uh, you got to ask me to speak oh, yeah, over. I've, I've been yeah, I've been on him before that too. Uh, I, I just think this is a better clash of styles too, in terms of um, you know, I, I I think Bisping beats Stan. But I think this is a lot more interesting. Belcher, I, I think Stan. I think I think Bisping has such a suspect chin. I mean, Jorge Rivera almost knocked him out in the beginning of the second round. If Stan can land on him clean once, I think that fight turns. Yeah, this is a fight though that if I think if Bisping gets out of the first round, I think uh, I think he tires Stan out and, and and does his does his stick and move thing that he does to a lot of guys. Or no, just let's get, let's, down a bunch. Let's get back. Uh, you know, hopefully that fight gets down. We can talk about it uh, sometime in the future. Um, but let's get back to Ortiz and Griffin. Um, like I said earlier, uh, Griffin is a uh, three to one favorite over Ortiz. Uh, do you see this fight going any differently than their first two? Griffin was kind of. He was asked about how he thinks the fight will go, and he's talking about how they, you know, they. You can game plan all you want, but he feels like when they get in the cage, they're sort of going to get back into that same rhythm that they've they've been in. 
probably. I think I hope that Forrest does try to. I mean, there were a couple points, especially in that second fight, where Forrest could have turned it on a little bit and attempted to be more aggressive and land more shots, but instead he just kind of hung back and saved up for his next, you know, head kick from distance or whatever. I hope that the fire around this fight a little bit, people doubting him, the surrounding around what was really just a joke quote of his, which is that what somebody said, would you retire if uh, Tito beats you? And he said, if Tito beats me, I'll retire from life. Which basically, you know, I'll kill myself if Tito Ortiz beats me, but he didn't say it like that. So he's had to explain that out now. I hope that he comes with a little fire under his ass and puts Tito away in the second. I, I don't think he'll finish him. Uh, I think Little Nog finished him. I mean, and Forrest hits harder than Little Nog does. I don't know about that. I don't know about, I don't know about that, Derek. He's probably got 30 pounds on Little Nog. Yeah, and Little Nog's got a better technique than Forrest does in terms of throwing better, punches. Better boxing, but as far as a head kick, you know, push kicks, things like that, I bet that Forrest has more weight and more power behind those shots. I'm going to ask you, Derek, how many, how many TKO victories do you think Forrest Griffin has in his career? You know what? Let's test the speed of my internet versus my. I have the answer for you. This question, it's, I bet you do. You wouldn't ask me a question if you didn't know the answer. It's three. The only one in the UFC was against Elvis Sinisic. In two. Well, look at the guys he's fought since. These guys he's fought since Elvis Sinisic. Okay, Tito Ortiz, Stefan Bonner, Keith Jardine, which was a weird loss. Uh, then Hector Ramirez comeback fight. Since then, Hua, Jackson, Evans, Anderson Silva, Tito Ortiz, Rich Franklin, Hua again. Not a lot of easy KOs or TKOs to be I, had on that list. Yeah, not saying that, but I mean, he's fought Tito twice. He hasn't finished him either time. I don't think Tito's fallen that far off. I, I think he's still tough enough to. Uh, and, and he's also a skilled enough grappler that I don't think he's going to get submitted either. So. Well, you were saying this on Twitter the other day, and I was saying the same thing for the Vandalay versus uh, Franklin rematch. These first, these last fights, last time these guys fought was in 2009. Like, it's yeah. hard for me to wrap my head. It doesn't fucking feel like that was three years ago, but it was. Yeah, that someone mentioned it. It might have been Anik uh, during the press conference today, and, and I had to do a double take because that fight, that, that second fight feels like it happened last year. Well, that was November of 09, so that was like two and a half years ago. But Vandalay versus Franklin was literally like, Three summers ago, and that fucks. Yeah. Yes, it's it's very weird. Um, wait, I'll take Griffin. I think Griffin wins a decision here. Um, but the main event, the one, the only fight that that you know, as, as solid as this card is, kind of up to down. Uh, the, the fight that everyone cares about is the the main event. Um, I wrote for my uh, my column at the ko corner dot com. Um, there there's four or five things here that that are you know I'm picking Silva. I like Silva in this fight. Uh, but there's four or five things that are kind of throwing me off. The first being, you know, we saw the first fight. And, you know, rib injury or not, we saw that, that Chow can take Anderson down, can hold him down uh, for four rounds. Um, you know, how serious that rib injury was, how serious it affected Silva, we, you know, you, you can only speculate. Um, but we, we do know what we saw in that first fight. So that changed everyone's opinion. Uh, the first fight closed... I believe at like a minus 450, uh, this one has been kind of sitting around minus 260, minus 265. So, um, you know, the, the books have, have, have adjusted um, from what we saw in the first fight. Uh, but like I said, that, that rib injury, uh, you know, how much did that affect Silva? That's, you know, if, if Anderson was in a, a lot of pain or if it sort of just restricted his breathing or if it sort of uh, caused him to uh, pace himself at a different uh, level than usual, um, you know, we might be seeing a completely different Anderson Silva, but uh, it's also been almost two years, two and a half years uh, since that first fight. Um, I, you know, I, I think Silva's aged better, uh, which is surprising. I, I figure with the style that Chow fights, which is similar to like a, a Dan Henderson or a Randy Couture, that, that he would have that same sort of longevity, which he might still. Um, but in, in the, the intervening two years, uh, Silva's had two pretty... Uh, high-level performances against Vitor Belfort and Yushin Okami, while Sonnen uh, did a, a, a real bang-up job against Brian Stan, but uh, you know that fight against Bisping really left a sore taste in a lot of people's mouths. Uh, a lot of people, you know, gave the fight to Bisping. Uh, at the same time, that Bisping fight uh, probably one of the worst style matchups uh, for for Chael. Uh and then also Chael's TRT use, um, not the actual use itself, but uh, given the parameters that the Nevada Commission sent down uh, in terms of his testosterone to epitestosterone level needing to be 6 to 1. Uh, and, <clears throat> and I haven't really seen anyone really talk to him about it. 
at these press conferences. Um, just, you know, is that going to be an issue for him mentally heading into the fight? And the, also the, the one thing that I kind of forgot to write about um, but came up a couple months ago is, is Silva injured going into this fight? Um, we heard a rumor. I don't know where it started. It may have been with our favorite uh, guerrilla journal, journalist on Twitter. Um, but there were rumors that, that Silva had hurt his knee, uh, whether that was legitimate, whether that was uh, another ploy for him in negotiations with the UFC. Uh, as we recently found out, that fight was not signed at the time of the first press conference a few months ago. Um, so whether that, or maybe even as a smokescreen for Chael, uh, is something for him to target. Um, you know, so I'm still confident picking Silva, but all those things, you know, for a fight with two guys with, you know, some 50 or 60 plus fights combined and obviously 25 minutes in the cage together, uh, sort of kind of making me question what, what's actually going to happen on Saturday night. Uh, but after that rant, Derek, I, I think I covered it all, but if you have anything to add, I'd love to hear it. There is a movie called um, Valley of the Wolves, Iraq. It came out in Turkey in uh, 2006. And uh, it features uh, Americans torturing Arabs. Um, apparently there was a container that didn't have air holes in it, so we just shot a bunch of holes in it and killed everybody inside. And also a Jewish-American U.S. Army doctor, played by Gary Busey, who, remo- who removes organs from injured civilian prisoners to sell to rich people in New York, London, and Tel Aviv for transplantation. And uh, the reason I bring that up is because Tito Ortiz was in this movie. Uh, what does that have to do with the fight? You said everything that it could possibly be said about that fight in your fucking five-minute rant. So I decided to look up Tito Ortiz's movie career while you were doing that, and I discovered that he was in a piece of anti-American propaganda that came out in Turkey six years ago. Well, that's very interesting. I still would like to hear your opinion on the fight, though. Will Chael Sonnen get sub? He's going to get the takedown. He's going to, at least in the first round, at least a couple of rounds, he's going to be sitting on top. All the rumblings and all of the uh, rumors have been that Chael is trying to sub Anderson, that he thinks that'd be the greatest thing ever to do. That he, from top position, he thinks he can snatch a head and arm triangle, something along those lines, an Americana. And that he uh, paid his jiu-jitsu trainer for this camp that he brought in, uh, Vinny Magalish, uh, formerly of M1 and soon to be a free agent, the UFC better pick him up as soon as they can. And he gave Vinny a check for double the amount that they had agreed upon, and on the memo line, he wrote Defeat Silva. So Sonnen obviously has a lot of faith in his jiu-jitsu going into this uh, bout. I don't think he's going to get too fancy with it, but I think that from top position, if he realizes you know these punches really aren't going to finish Anderson anytime soon, he may go for more of a head and arm choke. But my focus is on Anderson's fury and on how quickly he strikes coming out into those beginning portions of the round. I don't think we're going to see a replay of the first round, the first minute of the first round from their last fight when he dances around a little bit and gets caught by Che a couple of times. I think it's going to be more like the fourth round where Anderson came out and did everything in his power to finish him before the fight hit the ground. I think Anderson does that for five rounds and catches him at some point wins by TKO. See, that's interesting. I, I still think that first round, I still think we're going to see that uh, that slow feeling out period because Anderson does that in every single fight. Yeah, but Chael may not. Chael may come right at him in the first minute of the first round instead of trying to box with him. He may have a different uh, game plan that he did the last time. That's true. Um, you know, and, and one of the things with a guy like Anderson, the, you know, the best defense is to get him on the ground because uh, then you don't even have to worry about him hitting you in the face uh, with – Obviously, yeah, and, Ch- and Chael said, you know, immediately after the fight, uh, Anderson hit him with a body kick. I believe it was the uh, beginning of the third round before it hit to the ground. And he said, yeah, I've never been kicked that hard in my entire life. And he yeah. was really thrown with reckless abandon at the beginning of the fourth when it was clear that he had lost the first three rounds and he was going to have to finish. It was almost like, OK, try to knock him out in the fourth, go for the sub in the fifth. But I think that Anderson is motivated to a level that he hasn't been before. That, to me, letting all this pre-fight shit that everybody nuts their pants over influence me a little bit. I normally ignore all of it, but in this case, I think it's real. And I think that Anderson is going to do everything he can to finish the fight before it gets to a point where Chael can sit on him for three minutes. Well, I, you know, I, I always tend to, you know, as much as I get hyped by the uh, pre-fight stuff, I, I tend to disregard it in terms of uh, you know, how I think the fight will go down. I, I hope um, that Anderson learned from the Maya fight that kind of going nuts in the cage uh, is 
not going to do him any good. Um, it, it, you know, it was extremely entertaining f- to me for the, the first two and a half rounds where Silva was baiting and goading Maya with, with all sorts of taunts and gestures. Um, but, uh, you know, he definitely slowed down those last two rounds. And, and whether that had to do with the, the heat in Abu Dhabi or the, the kind of adrenaline dump of, of kind of <laughs> pulling that stunt, um, I, I hope that he, he's kind of learned from that um, because I think if he comes out with that sort of mentality, um, you know, I think there's a better chance that we see Chael Sonnen as the new middleweight champion on Saturday night. But I, I, I don't think that I, I think we're going to see the same Anderson Silva that we always do. I think we're going to see a guy who takes the first minute or two to figure out <clears throat> the distance, uh, you know, the range that he's going to need. Um, you know, if Chael puts the pressure on him, you know, that might change, and he might have to, you know, change his game plan on the fly. But um, I also think I, I tend to. to I tend to believe the injury rumor, or not rumor, but the injury, uh, the, the rib injury and how it affected the fight. Um, I don't think Anderson, uh, you know, if he was legitimately wanting to sub Chow Son in, I don't think that's going to be an issue. I think he's going to try to finish the fight and do it as violently as possible. Um, I think Anderson, I, I think I've, I've said it in the past, I think uh, TKO in, in round three, I think that's, I think I'm going to stick with that. Uh, I, I do want to ask you, Derek. Over under on uh, takedowns for Chael Sonnen, and I'll put the number at three and a half. Ooh, shit! I'll have to go under because I think at most it's one per round. And you think it's going to get finished? Before I think, I think, I think third or fourth. I don't, I don't think it'll go as long as it did last time. I think three and a half is a pretty good number. I think uh, that's a tough one. That that's either that's really win or lose. Because if you think Chael's going to get four or five, then you're probably giving him the fight. Right, exactly. I agree. Shit, that was a good over-under. I, I have to harp on this Valley, is, uh, Valley of the Wolves or Rack anymore. Tito Ortiz, you claim to be so, you know, down with the troops, good for the U.S. Army. You know, the U.S. Army recommends that Army personnel overseas not approach cinemas in which this movie is played. <laughs> Do you know what he was doing in it? He was a major U.S. official, according to the... Uh, wikipedia page here he is not involved in the plot summary but um basically the bad guys in this movie are quote the christians the kurds the americans and the jews and uh i mean have you seen this movie i'm kind of i'm intrigued to see it now but i've heard about it before because sometimes i'll hop on the wikipedia and just go to the banned movies list because it's constantly updated in different countries for different reasons and this is a movie that was basically, I mean, it happened right at the height of the insurgency in Iraq. This was before the surge. This was when we were really afraid of civil war breaking out between the Kurds, the Sunnis, and the Shias. And this was Turkey saying, you know, first of all, fuck the Kurds, because we've been saying that for hundreds of years. And B, America, I mean, even the filmmaker admits maybe 60 or 70 percent of what happens on screen is factually true. Interesting. Interesting. They, they, and like I said, a subplot of this movie is that American soldiers were murdering civilians so that a Jewish doctor, could, played by Gary Busey, could remove the organs from injured civilian prisoners to sell to rich people in New York, London, and Tel Aviv for transplantation. Why is Tito Ortiz involved in this anti-Semitic piece of shit movie? <laughs> Billy Zane was in it, too. It's really... I, I'm, I'm kind of interested to watch it now, just to see what the fuck. The Daily Show did make fun of it a little bit ago, and I think they used it more of a foil to say, oh, how dare they use us as stereotypes, and then showed a bunch of clips from Hollywood of, like, you know, Arab terrorists. <laughs> so, you know, tit for tat and everything, but what the fuck? There are people, there's a lot of people in the Middle East that genuinely believe shit about Jews, so. <laughs> um, so the, the UFC's been doing this International Fight Week thing uh, for UFC 148, um, pretty much a week-long sort of Celebration. It's kind of it's kind of an interesting title. I, I'm kind of confused why they went with that, but uh, I, I want to read this quote. I believe it's from uh, Mr. Dana White. Um, For years, the UFC has done a big Vegas show around the Fourth of July weekend, and now we've made it a focal point in our calendar. For UFC 148, we've got fans coming in from all over the country, tons of people from Brazil and Canada and as far away as England, Japan, and Australia to see this fight. Uh, Vegas is the UFC's hometown. It's where we are located. Uh, this is where we are from, and we're proud to be contributing to the local economy. 
The first annual International Fight Week will be awesome. The fans are going to have a Fight Week experience better than anything they've ever had before. And each year, we're going to build this thing to the point where every fan on the planet knows they have to come to Vegas for this July Fight Week at least once in their lives. Uh, Brian Alvarez from Figure Four Weekly said that this is the UFC's answer to WWE WrestleMania weekend. It really sounds more to me like like uh, the NFL Super Bowl week. Um, but it really seems that they're kind of making uh, the July fourth show the official UFC Super Bowl main event deal. Which is really, it's very smart. I, I like having a big New Year's Eve show too, but at that point you have the um, NFL regular season wrapping up and the playoffs getting underway. You have uh, basketball season getting into the meat of their schedule, hockey doing the same thing. So it's kind of a tough time to be the biggest sports story, especially if there's a big year in boxing fight. But the 4th of July weekend is perfect. Baseball's done. Football hasn't started yet. Uh, basketball just had the... Say, baseball's well, oh, done? Hey, no, no, uh, I'm sorry. Um, basketball is done. They just had their draft. Um, nobody gives a shit about baseball. There's not a lot of crossover between that and MMA fans. Mike, you're a weird dude. <laughs> That's all I can say. You're, it's weird to, you know, fucking go on to uh, the, the weird geeky baseball. To know what war is and know what fucking WAR stands for and be an MMA fan, you're a rare breed. I think there's more out, uh, there's more of us out there than no, you no. might expect. We're in a little teeny tiny MMA media bubble where we've got relatively smart people that liked MMA, but they liked other things before that. That's 5% of all MMA fans that go on the internet. It's a teeny <laughs> tiny little sliver. The other 95% fucking smell weird, and they don't know what the <laughs> hell you're talking about when you talk about war. Yeah, I did have someone ask me what it meant. And I've had that. No, but I, I like I was. I love the July seventh thing. I think that having four big events, if they can do like one big event every you know few months or so, then that's awesome. But at least they have an annual, uh, kind of a semi annual thing now between um, July and the New Year's Eve card. It's not going to go back to every single card is just stacked top to bottom with fights that you've been dying to see for years. We're past that point. It's yeah. not that you can have two title fights on every pay per view card and a number one contender, you know, bringing up the rear. There are a lot of fighters. There are a lot of fights that need to happen. And if you want to be selective about it, then fine. But the last thing I want to see is the number, the opportunities for fighters to fight in the UFC to shrink in order to appease what we think should be. Fuck that. Let's have more fights and more fighters getting paid to fight more. Yeah, and the thing I like about it too is, is you know, it, it kind of brands that week uh, as their big thing. I, I just kind of like that. You know, they, there's going to be one show a year that they sort of, uh, you know, try to really stack up and make a really awesome show. Of course, the 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 peril here is that uh, you know, if we see a, a situation like UFC 147 or, or any other uh, UFC 149 where we, we get tons of injuries, tons of replacements, um, like imagine if Silva had had pulled out of this fight. Um, you know, they're going to scramble to put together uh, an equally. And not, they're, they're, there's no way they're going to get an equally as it's good fight, but they're going to have to scramble to put together a really big fight, and it's going to sort of put a damper on the the sort of. Uh, right. No, and and that's that's do. that's something you can't plan against. I mean, you can plan against, it, but you can't avoid it. If you name a fight that people want to see, there's a possibility that one of the guys involved in it is going to get injured before the fight happens. That's just right. part of the game. But I, I think that Vegas is really happy with it as well because it turns into a, hey, do you want to spend the 4th of July in Vegas? Ah, that sounds like fun. They're doing the big UFC thing. Definitely. Now I want to go. It turns that 4th of July in Vegas weekend into also a UFC fan weekend. And I think merging those two is a really smart idea. Yeah, I agree. Um, I, I do want to bring up something. Um, I, I don't believe you watched the uh, press conference today with uh, Tito and Forrest. And Kung Lee and Patrick Cote, and I actually missed this. I was actually making food, and I ran into the kitchen, and I came back, and uh, I, I saw the, uh, uh, the tweets about it. There was a, a media member who was asking uh, Kung Lee a question, and at, at the end of it, I guess, he said something about how he, he looks good or he looks in good shape. No homo. <laughs> and I made the, the quip, and it wasn't a serious thing, but, but which is worse, the MMA media or the multinational promotion that credentials them and the only point i was trying to make was that um you know as weird and 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 temperamental as the ufc is about credentialing people they also credential a lot of people uh and and none uh, i don't think anyone's really gone this far where it's kind of that big of a a head scratcher but oh man are we going to go now from where we were to saying that the ufc should restrict media access i'm not saying they should restrict but i (laughs) mean 
They should if, be pickier about I, it. They should, they should choose their venues more carefully. I'm saying this. If you come into a press conference and say, you look great, no homo, that's the last press conference you're coming to. I there, can agree with that. There has I, to be I, some sort of, of – there has to be some sort of um, – I mean, I guess they don't have to be. They can do whatever they want. Uh, but it would be nice to see uh, some sort of uh, accountability and personal uh, sort of uh, code of conduct for these sort of events. Because it, it does make the sport look, look Bush League. Well, that brings me to my uh, our tweet of the week this week. Um, oh. This one that came today is from our uh, former friend at Bloody Elbow at SS Reporters. And uh, I can't wait until Adam Schefter says, Tom Grady, you look in great shape. No homo at a press conference. <laughs> MMA media is truly embarrassing. <laughs> and then there was this one last night from um, Mike Goldberg in response to uh, Brandon from New Jersey saying, uh, man, you're so unhip when Mike Goldberg said he was time for fireworks with his family. And Mike Goldberg tweeted, and I quote, and your opinion is so unimportant and irrelevant to me. And I'm guessing the rest of the world dot dot. You know, I've never understood why people uh, in, in that sort of position even bother responding to that stuff. It just makes you look dumb. petty. They're not smart. He has to get a thousand of those a day. I, he, I, I've had him. This was a few years ago now, but I had him respond to something I said about him that wasn't that I didn't use his his Twitter handle. Like, so he must have like he must have like a a search bar up about his name, and then he caught it and said something back. I thought I, that was really weird. It's just. You know, fucking how many times do you have to have shit talking on you on the internet? And you know what's happened to Goldberg for a decade. Like, yeah. You just got to drop it at some point. You know, I, I, I get my own share of shit talking, and I, I like to take it and strive fun with it. I think it's, it's funny to uh, – I, I think it's funny that people even go out of their way to do that stuff. And then, you know, I, obviously I do it to an extent as well, but I don't – I feel like I have a, a, a certain – uh, intelligence about it. All yeah, right, it's, it, 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 I can't. It, we have th- these discussions every week about how idiots handle the media, and this is how idiots handle the media because they're idiots. Like, I, there's nothing else to be said. Yeah. Uh, last thing regarding uh, Anderson Silva, uh, there was an article. I don't remember. I think it was in one of the Brazilian uh, outlets. Uh, I guess Vitor Belfort gave an interview. He said that if he had beaten Vanderlei Silva, uh, had he not gotten injured, that they were going to give him a title shot against Anderson Silva, um, which kind of caught me off guard. I don't know how you feel about that. That was a little weird to me. I don't know about the legitimacy of it. That may have just been something that Vitor and Lorenzo talked about. And, you know, Lorenzo, well, maybe he and Fertitta were having a drink, and then the next day somebody asked him about it, and Fertitta said, no, nah, fuck away. Like, I was just, you know, making conversation, being nice. But at the same time, if Chael was out of commission or if Anderson was really adamant at that point, not fighting Chael, not fighting Chael, who else would they have put him up against? I mean, Chris Weidman's not ready. Right. Um, and, and I, you know, I look at his record. Uh, if he had beaten Vanderlei, it would have been Vanderlei, Anthony Johnson, and Yoshihiro Akiyama. Um, you know, not exactly the worst group of guys to beat, but also, you know, there's no Bisping in there. There's no, uh, there's no other top ten, you know, Weidman kind of guys, Maya. I guess Maya's making his uh, leaving 170, but um, you know there, there wasn't there wasn't anyone in that list that that really jumps out at you. Mm-mm. No, it, not really. Like I said, I mean at, at 185 right now, that's when people talk about John Jones having quote unquote cleaned out 205. Not really. You got Gustafsson and a couple other guys that are coming up that may be worthy competitors in a year or so, maybe a year and a half. But Anderson Silva has really beaten everybody of worth of note at 185. Yeah. Uh, one interesting thing, I tweeted about this uh, a few hours ago, and I didn't notice it until today. Uh, it looks like the uh, – <laughs> Matt Roth uh, sent me an IM. The no homo guy was from MMAHawaii.com, which sounds like a uh, high-end media outlet. I thought that was uh, BJPen.com. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, if you go to MMAHawaii.com, it looks like a really well put together website. Wink. Um, uh, I just noticed this today. Uh, it looks like the uh, SB Nation slash Bloody Elbow slash USA Today rankings are now only the SB Nation MMA rankings or MMA Nation rankings, as they worded. Um, so it looks like I, I've kind of heard about this in the background. I, I haven't gotten any sort of confirmation uh, from any of my former 
contacts and colleagues at uh, Bloody Elbow, but uh, I had heard for a long time that once uh, MMA Junkie came on board with USA Today that whenever the contract ran up with SB Nation that that deal was going to go south. Um, obviously, Junkie and SB Nation are, are uh, competitors, so it looks like the exposure in USA Today is over. Have you heard anything about that, Derek? I, I'm, nobody asked me for a ballot last month. Normally, we get that email about the 20th or so, right around that uh, third or fourth week of the month, and I just didn't get a request for it for June, so I assume that the uh, SBN USA Today rankings have, in fact, died. Uh, they just released a new set, so maybe maybe you finally pissed Nate off enough, and you're I gone. Guess. Maybe. Well, no, but that was like two days ago. They should have asked me for that two weeks ago. That's what I'm saying. They they uh they they posted the new rankings July second. Yeah, we had our fight after that. Our little fifth thing. Uh, that was like that's true. yeah. Such you a are you are still listed in these sources though, right? Uh, right above uh, Luke Thomas of SB Nation. Yeah, and I believe Hawani still has it listed on there too, even though he never acceded to have his ratings included. Hawani not on the list. Michael David Smith, uh, no longer of MMA fighting, is still on there, listed at MMA fighting. Also, he's Matt just- Roth. Matt Roth, apparently of Head Kick Legend, uh, Leland right. Rowling of Bloody Elbow. Yep, that's because uh, of it. that's how that's how well they kept that site up. That's how yep. often they uh, updated it, and, I, and I'm pretty sure that's not Richard Wade's fault. He did a hell of a job uh, tabulating yes. everything. We, yes, yes, we've made fun of it before, and they should have. You know, if they'd put him in charge of that, he'd probably still be alive. Yep, or even me, because I was the one that always did the house cleaning over there at Bloody Elbow uh, in terms of sidebar shit. Um. Derek, have you been following the California stuff at all? To the point that I am aware of it, yes. I once again think that Zach Arnold is chicken little because I I don't think that California is going to allow a situation in which they're not able to hold athletic competitions of a certain amount for a year because of no money. I just don't believe that that's going to be the terminus of this. If it's house cleaning in the CSAC that happens, if they have, you know, better – uh, allocation of funds, if they get rid of some people and put some new ones in, they can do nothing but do good because the CSAC isn't exactly a crack squad, although they did catch Barnett and uh, amongst other people in recent years. I uh, I listened to Jordan Breen's press roll this week. Uh, by this week, I mean today. Uh, it was him and Zach Arnold. Um, and I was sort of only listening uh, kind of uh, halfway. I was I was working at the same time, but, uh, you know, Zach brought up a, a couple of things that were interesting. It, it sounded like, um, the state had been using the athletic commission as, uh, a way to stash people or reward people, uh, like moving them around. Um, if, uh, you know, if they, if they couldn't afford them in a certain department, they would move them over to the athletic commission. Uh, it also, the, the most interesting thing in that regard, um, was where, uh, a commission like Nevada or New Jersey pays you a flat fee uh, for working an event. Uh, the uh, California Commission would pay you uh, time and a half because most of these people are state employees full time. Uh, they would send people and they would get to bill the state at time and a half uh, of their regular uh, wage and also get uh, benefits like uh, you know travel benefits and, and hotel rooms and stuff. Um, him and Breen were telling a story. I think it was uh, Bellator did a fight in Lemoore, which is where uh, Tachi Palace uh, has their events uh, mostly. And they had 18 fighters in the card and also 18 state officials working it, which yeah. I, it sounds and like that's an extremely high number. It, it sounds like this is a little bit of kind of bureaucratic money moving and you know some sweetheart deals between members of the commission and people that they wanted to help out. Happens everywhere. It seems a little more egregious here. There was one um, discussion that happened at one of the hearings that they did about the number of state officials at a smaller show. And they said, well, we needed them there to provide security. And one of the commissioners had to literally stand up and say, that's not our fucking job. We don't provide security for the venue. That's the promoter's job. Right. So it sounds like there's been a lot. You know, it, it sounds like there needs to be some serious house cleaning. But as far as the nuclear, you know, there's no going to be no more fights in California. I don't buy that. Well, the interesting thing is, I don't, you know, from what I gathered from what Zach was saying on the show, it's not so much that there won't be any fights, but he seems to believe that you're not going to see as many UFC fights coming through, and a lot of the burden's going to be passed off onto the, you know, those mid level or low level shows. And, um, I mean, you, you just look at Hawaii. Hawaii was a state, uh, this is 
uh, what Jordan was Jordan Breen was saying. How I would state they had a, a pretty pretty good fight community out there for a long time, and then uh, you know the state came in and regulated it, but put a really uh, oppressive okay. tax rate on it. Yeah, uh, yeah. You the don't see fights on like yeah, yeah, like eight nine percent something like that. Yeah, you don't see a lot of fights in Hawaii, and that's why you don't see the UFC there. Uh, as yep. you know, they they talked a lot a, a lot about uh, putting BJ Penn in Aloha Stadium, uh, having a a big show for him, and uh, that's that dream is pretty much over. I mean, it's, unless BJ comes out, beats Rory McDonald, and and kind of has a couple of other years in the sport, and things change in Hawaii. Um, but it sounds like that was more of the worry in California. I, I'm not sure exactly why, if they're going to have to, you know, increase taxes on events or or what. But um, the, regardless of what ends up happening, the situation right now is a mess. It is, and it's it, this is. I've always been a defender and a fan of the arrangement where certain responsibilities are not in the promoters or the fighters' hands. The drug testing is handled by the government. The, the insurance for the venue and for the fighters has to be paid to the government. There's, there's an elimination of conflicts of interest there. It's not a perfect system, and you can see a lot of the results that happen with the bureaucracy here in California. But at the same time, I think it's the worst system of all, as, except for all the other ones, like Churchill said about democracy. Yes, it sucks, but there really isn't an alternative that's better than it. As far as saying, well, we don't really need ACs. You know, who, why do we even have licensing things? Why do we need them in order to have a fight in this state? There's a lot of reasons for that. So, well, it goes back to you know, in a perfect world, you don't need uh, athletic commission. In a perfect world, you have you know magnanimous promoters that want to have uh, ambulances in the building and make sure everyone's got you know covered on the in a, you know the event insurance and all that. But but like you said, this is not this is not a perfect world, and there are, there are reasons why an athletic commission. Sorry about burping here. Uh, why the athletic commissions are uh, are necessary, or at least beneficial um, overall. Um, Jason Amati on Twitter uh, tweeted at us: uh, "You guys aren't wrong or anything, but it's crazy how no one talks about Mark Munoz. It's pretty wild." And then you you responded to him: uh, "He is a favorite of mine, but Anderson would eat his soul." And Jason responded back: uh, "Yeah, I'm just saying that people pretend like he's not even a top contender. He almost never comes up. I, that is interesting because I think he's." Uh, I think I think a lot of people look at it the way you did the, the Maya fight. You know, either should or shouldn't have gone his way. They they have a lot of question marks after that fight. It, I do love Munoz. I I don't know how what he would do against Chris Weidman because I think Weidman's a better wrestler, so that may be troublesome for him. But he did beat Aaron Simpson, who might be a better wrestler too. Yeah, I I do love Mark Munoz, and I think I gave him the Maya fight, but I think that against Anderson Silva's accurate striking and ability to keep distance, there's absolutely no hope of him winning that fight with his hands. Yeah, I think a lot of it. I think the perception comes, um, you know, one uh, his UFC debut, he got his head kicked into the first, you know fifth row uh, by Mark Hamill of all people, and then you know he ended up winning or losing a split decision to Yusuf Kami. But I don't, I mean, from what I remember that fight, he looked pretty bad in that fight. Um, it, think, he had his moments. He won a round. I definitely gave him one round, and he had kind of a flurry in the second round that looked decent, but Okami won. Yeah. Um, it shouldn't have been a split decision, but it should have been 29-28. Yeah, and also he's 34. I mean, his window is, is you know, it's not going to be open for much longer, so if he's going to make a serious run, which, to be fair, he has done. He's got a, a pretty solid four-fight winning streak over uh, Aaron Simpson, C.B. Dalloway, Damian Maya, and, and Chris Levin. Um and I believe he's fighting. Uh, yeah, he's supposed to fight uh, Weidman uh, next. Was it next Tuesday or Wednesday? Um, and that's not great for him. I think Weidman wins that fight, which kind of sucks. I'd like to see him against Belfort because I think he could do something there. Yeah, um, man. Why? Why? Why are, they, why are the UFC putting fights on in the middle of the week? I don't understand this. Can you confirm that July 11th is on? Uh, let me let me verify. Uh, Tuesday or Wednesday here. I'm. Let me Google that for you, Mike. Yeah, it's on. It's a Wednesday. Yeah, it's on the 11th next Wednesday. I I don't understand. Whatever. Whatever. Um, Trying to mix it up a little bit, man. Yeah, and trying to brand Friday night as the UFC, but for some reason doing a show on a Wednesday. Um, Speaking of UFC on fuel shows, uh, we alluded to this earlier. The UFC officially making their debut in China, I believe, in November. In uh, I hope I'm pronouncing Macau right. No, um, man, that's pretend China. This totally doesn't count. The UFC sucks at everything. If people don't know about Macau, it's, it's basically the Vegas of Asia. It's, it, it's basically I, the Vegas of the world. It's bigger yeah, than I, Vegas, and it takes in more money. Yes. Um, 
there's there are a lot of crazy gambling cultures out Vegas, there. Vegas is basically the Macau of America. <laughs> yes. Uh, so that'll be interesting. Um, you know, I think I think they'll be able to sell the show out. I, you know, there's a lot of international travel over there, so I don't think uh, getting people in the doors is going to be an issue. Uh, but it will be interesting uh, to see how they stack that card. Uh, like I said, it, it sound there were rumors uh, or reports that, uh, regardless of the result on Saturday, that Kung Lee will appear in that show. Um, I imagine they're going to stack that show with, you know, like the the Japan show. Uh, you know, they're going to stack it with, uh, you know, Asian guy, Asian fighters, Filipino fighters. Um, but it is interesting. I you know it kind of caught me off guard. I wasn't uh, I was not expecting to see the UFC in China this year. Well, nobody was. Every time they announce something like that, everyone says, oh, they're full of shit. That's at least two, three years away, if they ever do it. And then they fucking do it, and we poo-poo it. I think it's awesome. It, it is an inroads into the largest untapped market in the world when it comes to mainstream mixed martial arts. They have it. They have the Super Pro Fight League in India, second most populous country in the world. China's at $1.3 billion, and now those guys are going to be able to see the UFC in a way and in – syndication for perpetuity over there that they haven't been able to see it before. And if that inspires 10,000 people to get really into the sport, how is that fucking not worth the money? Yeah, it's going to be interesting. Uh, I'm, you know, I, I actually recently heard a uh, NPR story uh, about expatriates over in China, and uh, it, it was really interesting. I, I kind of caught it halfway in, so I, I missed the, the intro and, and the beginning of it. But it, it sounds like life over there... It, the term that they kept using was "it's complicated" uh, when when they get asked about certain uh, things over there and uh, certain practices of the government, um, they find themselves after a while saying it's complicated. Um, so it'll be interesting. It'll be interesting to see how the UFC handles it, how uh, how it's received over there. Um, like I we said, we don't, don't know who we need to bribe yet or how much. <laughs> I, I, I don't think do some math. I, I don't think they'll have problems, uh, like I said, selling uh, tickets or anything. But it, it will be interesting to see how it. We don't want to bribe oh, two guys for the same thing, right? <laughs> exactly. Now, Derek, I I, I was tweeting yeah, about clearly. this earlier. I was tweeting about this earlier in the week. I, how big of a poker guy are you? I love poker. I if I okay. had money, I'd play it all the goddamn time. I like okay. playing it in person better than online, but I love poker. Did did you see any of my tweets or or the story at all about the crazy hand in the million dollar tournament at the World Series? I did read about the folded quads on the forums. So okay. I will. You, uh, you, go ahead. I, I will. For the people that, uh, that aren't familiar, uh, the, the World Series of Poker has a new tournament um, this year. It's a million-dollar buy-in. Uh, it's, I think it's called the Big One for the One Drop or something like that. Uh, it's a million-dollar buy-in. Uh, it's pretty much uh, the top professionals getting staked and a lot of uh, business people that can afford uh, a million dollars uh, on, a, on a poker tournament. Um, but here's, here's the hand. Here's how it happened. Uh, Tom Dwan, who is a uh, probably one of the top three or four players in the world, uh, he opens a, a raise to 32,000. Uh, this Russian named, uh, I don't know his first name, uh, Mikhail Shmirnov, calls in the small blind with uh, eights, red eights, and businessman John Morgan calls from the big blind. The flop comes jack of spades, eight of clubs, seven of spades. Smirnov hits a set, he bets 50,000, Morgan calls quickly, and Dwan folds. So it's head up, heads up now. The turn of the, is the eight of spades, uh, which brings out the straight, the flush, the straight flush possibilities. Uh, also giving Smirnoff quads, though. Uh, Smirnoff bets 200,000. Morgan called instantly. Um, Smirnoff, according to the cardplayer.com article, Smirnoff said Morgan looked very excited on the turn. Uh, the, the river was the king of spades, uh, which gives the, the four flush on the board. Smirnoff bets 700,000, which was more than the pot of 600,000. Morgan thought about it briefly and shoved for 3.4 million total. Um, I be- and and Shminov, I believe, started the hand with three and a half million. So by my calculations, I, I believe he had to call uh, about two and a half million in a pot that was uh, two million before uh, 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 Morgan went all in. So the crazy part of the hand is that Shminov folds the quads, and not that he just folded the quads, but he folded them face up. So at this point, Derek, I would like to hear your thoughts on the hand and what you would have done in that situation. I got to I got to applaud the guy, number one, because I pride myself primarily on my reading ability and my ability to fold hands that most people wouldn't. 
So I've folded hands on the river where I've been called crazy and turned out to be right. I respect that style of play where you have faith in your read of the progression of the hand. And what he said was, you know, there's no way he had two kings and that the river made him a full house because he would have been betting a lot more aggressively pre-flop and on the flop in order to get people out. Two jacks were possible. But he put him on 8-9 of spades, which would have given him the straight flush on the turn, the nine same card that gave him quads. 9-10 of spades, right. And that's what you know would have given him the straight flush in the winning hand. But if you have quads and you're putting on your opponent on either um, pocket jacks or the one hand that beats you, I still think you make that call. Yeah. Um, Phil Galfon, who was another uh, top uh, player, he said um, he was at the table. Said it was one of the, I think he said it was the craziest hand he ever saw. Uh, he put uh, Morgan 50-50 on um, having the straight flush. And if that's your read, if you think it's really 50-50, then pot odds say that you almost always have to call there. Um, my, thing, my thing about it is this, is that I could not justify, unless I was 100% sure, I could not justify folding the hand for two reasons. One, uh, if you win the hand, you put yourself in a great position in a tournament that I, I believe I read is, is pretty top-heavy in its payout. So you, you need to accumulate chips to really make a run at that those top money spots. But more so is I don't want to fold a hand there that I don't want to I don't want to fold find out later that he you know had the jacks um, and end up regretting not calling. I mean, and, and that's not a great reason to call, but. Um, given the other things factoring into it, um, how the hand played out, the fact that I don't think nine ten of suit uh, nine ten of spades is is a hundred percent there, uh, I just can't. I, I could not bring myself to fold uh, quads there. That board's super scary, obviously, but you know, you, it's hard to fold quads. Any even if if there's yeah. four to a royal flush out there and you have quads, like the board paired jacks and it's jack queen king of um jack 10 queen king of you know hearts right and you're just afraid of him having the ace of hearts you're still tempted to call there because you're looking at you know you have the second nuts with quads no matter what so right it, that's a really tough fold but it's not something where i'm like oh crazy russian bastard that guy has a phd in economics he's been killing the cash game circuit from everything i've read and had faith in his reads that's what a poker player needs even if you're wrong you got to have faith in your reads yeah, and you know what? I, when I initially read it, uh, I, I thought it was crazy and 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 dumb. But you know, once I started reading about it more and thinking about it, and also, you know, people on Twitter are kind of going back and forth with me, um, it's not as crazy as I initially thought. I still think uh, the I do think it's crazy to, to fold that shit face up, though. I think that's a pretty I think that's a pretty bad mistake. Belcher is now taking to Twitter to call out Michael Bisping. <laughs> Thank you for that update. I just think folding face up there, the only thing that does is give you that that sort and, of. Like, and, well, well, they're talking about the. They're talking about it as a number one contenders bet. So we were talking earlier about one eighty five kind of being devoid of talent, of you know contenders. And Mark Munoz, we skipped over, but Belcher versus Bisbing for the winner of Sonnen versus Silva. I am on board. Yeah. Also, thanks for totally no selling what I was saying. No, oh, I don't care. Appreciate that. Uh, yeah, that's, even a little. that's a good note to end on. That that hour fifteen sort of flew by there, Derek. That's because I'm good at this radio stuff. I guess so. Um, Erica, if you could please hit the music, and we can get ourselves out of here. Derek, anything else you want to say? Uh, heading out here. Um, I want to know if anybody that sees or can contact Tito Ortiz can ask him what he has against Jewish people. I'd be interested to know why he's so anti-Semitic. All right. Well, hopefully someone can get at Matt Roth. Tell him to try to track down Tito Ortiz and ask him what he has against the Jews. And with on that note, Derek and I will see you. Oh, well, actually, one final note. We'll see you guys on Sunday. We're going to do a, a special UFC 140. Oh, my God. It's an extra show. show, guys. It's going gonna to be do it fucking. 12 Eastern time. So uh, it'll probably be just Derek and I, but uh, we'll try to get Roth on. And, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll wrap up UFC 148 so we don't have to spend 40 minutes on it on Thursday. We might do it but anyway, though, because it's going to be a big show. It is. So tune in on Sunday. We'll see you next week.